Hi, everyone, and welcome to Book Break for the Greece Public Library, your spot for book recommendations. I'm Claire. I'm a librarian here. I lead As the Page Turns and also our historical book group on Facebook. And today, my special guest is Mindy, and we will be talking about books with a garden theme, hopefully to get us in the mood for spring. Hi, Mindy. Hi. Well, it's a perfect day for that spring-themed book break. I know. So. If I have one more person tell me how nice it is outside, I... Th- <laughs> So, yes, it's been quite tempting to step outside and have a story time outside or something. Oh, I know. And Mindy has a great display going on the library this month. Tell them a little bit about your display. Sure. So I really kicked it up a notch this month. I decorated our adult book display with violets and literary themed inspired quotes about springtime so you'll have to stop by and check them out make sure you take a walk around the whole display all four sides are decorated and all in midney's signature color yes, which she is wearing today for. as a hint yes the lavender lilac yes so, so awesome well, we are going to be talking a little bit about books that have at least a garden featured or flowers or something. So um, I will kick us off. I My first one is called The Red Garden by mm. Alice Hoffman. Have you read this one? I have not, but yeah, I was a big fan of Practical Magic. Yes, because yeah. you and I both like Alice Hoffman. Mm-hmm. Um, so this one was kind of different for her. It was like... Short stories. Oh. And they went in a timeline. So interconnected short stories. Mm. I I think that's a good word. And it starts, as always, in a town in Massachusetts, Mm. as almost, I believe, you know, so many of hers do. And I was hoping for witchiness Mm -hmm. because I like that about Alice Hoffman. But there was no real witchiness involved. That is surprising. Yeah. Yeah. Um, But the town, it starts in 1786. And it talks about the first settlers coming to the town. Hallie Mm -hmm. Brady was a young woman with nothing to lose. She was running from a predatory factory owner making unwanted advances. So she married this scoundrel who had the ability, he had the gift of gab. He was pretty much a salesman, so he talked a bunch of people into going with them to find, you know, this new town in Massachusetts. The winter was horrible. A lot of people were really struggling, kind of cursing themselves that they they followed this man. And um, Hallie finds a bear, And that it was originally, I think it might have been called Bear Town or something. But um, so a bear figures prominently in a lot of the stories. Like a real life bear? A real bear. Oh. Like a real bear. She befriends a real bear. Um, And she starts a garden, which she ends up burying a bear and then later a child. So everything in this garden grows red. So maybe um, there is a little, they didn't call her a witch, but there definitely is some magical realism at play here. Um, and then we have a river filled with eels and the people in the town make their money like making like eel leather belts, you know, and different things. Like who knew? That oh, you I could, expected you to say they made like jellied wreaths of eels or something like that. Yeah. Well, they ate them, <laughs> you know, they played a big part. Interesting. Um, John Chapman, uh, Johnny Appleseed, also oh. visited Blackwell and leaves his mark in more ways than one. Um, there's a giant apple tree in the town. It's a tree of life. Mm. They're called Look No Further Apples. Oh. Yeah. And then who else? We have a disappearing little girl who that storyline also plays forward in a lot of like the town lore, and they have was plays. Was that heirloom apple variety? Was that an actual thing? I I'm wonder. not sure if it's an actual I apple. I want to look it up, see if it's like Northern Spy or something. Yeah, yeah. that would be cool. What was it um, called again? It was called Look No Further okay. Apples. That would yeah. be really so interesting I, to know. I don't know whether um, Alice Hoffman embellished that or, uh-huh. or what. But yes, we have John Chapman. Uh, he also has a child that stays there. You know, Uh. so that's the other thing that he left. Um, So it's just, it was strange. You went through the Civil War and you had people disappearing. You had, you know, this, these 
intertwined families that mm-hmm. came down. Um, one of the stories dealt with this woman who used the garden to grow tomatoes. And when she would give you some of your, t- like her tomatoes, like your wishes would be fulfilled. Oh, interesting. Yeah, yeah, I would have liked some of those tomatoes. And it ends, it goes all the way up until 1986. Wow, that so is quite a span. Some of it, yeah, yeah like skips large chunks of time. But, uh-huh. you know, you have like the wars you know, mentioned and people Mm -hmm. going away and don't come back and then other people getting married. So it's hard to tell you like a plot line, but it's like I said, it's interconnected stories with like different generations showing up. You know, there's a bear or two that runs around and and it gets involved in different stories, storylines. It was unusual. I I can't say it was my favorite book of hers. It Mm -hmm. wasn't. It was interesting. I wanted more about the garden. Mm -hmm. Um, And there is some, you know, because it is a a prominent fixture in a lot of the stories. Mm -hmm. But like I said, I wanted like more magic. I wanted people like brewing and doing stuff with the plants in there. Yeah, you hear Alice Hoffman and you think. Yeah, I I wanted Alice Hoffman witchiness and I didn't get that. So I got were bears and tomatoes. (laughs) Just a quick note. It looks like it's called a seek no further apple in real life. Okay. And it's oh. also called the Westfield apple tree. Oh, and excellent sleuthing, Sean. Yeah, it. I, I got to know. <laughs> it's late season. See, that is definitely a okay. library, and I and love it. <laughs> harvest period, very late. Origin date, Massachusetts, 1796. Okay. Wow, and it takes about two to four years for it to bear fruit. Wow. Yeah. Huh. Okay. There you go. It also bloomed at different like times, like when it was snowing. Like it, it, all kinds of crazy things happened in this book. That but. segues perfectly into one of my books. Okay, <laughs> well let's 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 move right into that then. So I am going to talk about Garden Spells by Sarah Addison Allen, and it sounds like this book had all the missing Alice Hoffman plant witchiness that. I love that book. Oh, it was so much better than I thought it was going to be. I I picked it up and I glanced at it and I was like, yeah, right. The premise is that um, this family, the Waverleys, have a magical garden that does stuff to you when you eat food prepared from fruits and vegetables and flowers in the garden. And I was like, yeah, okay, how far-fetched is this going to be? It's actually really believable and amazing. Yeah. So the caterer, the main character, is named Claire. Right, Claire Waverly. And I love how they describe the food in there and just, and what it's meant to do. Like she'll talk about dandelion quince jelly is supposed to do something. And another recipe that caught my eye was blackberry cornbread, which I actually looked up how to make it. And it's really easy. It's just cornbread with a simple syrup of blackberries stirred into it. And it sounds amazing. Yeah, that sounds really good. But I want to do some more research about like all this. And they said like lavender for like hesitancy. And I just, I was fascinated. I love, love this kind. So I'm definitely going to take copious detailed notes in her, her plant glossary in the back of it. But the center of this garden is an apple tree that has quite the personality. It was a little far-fetched when the family would claim that it threw apples at people. Mm -hmm. But... (laughs) It was pretty amusing. And the story centered around the relationship between two sisters, Sydney and Claire. And Sydney was getting out of a bad relationship with her daughter, Bay, and traveled back home to Bascom, North Carolina, and stayed with her sister in a big old Grand Queen Anne Victorian house. So it was very practical magic in that way, mm-hmm. too, yeah. which was nice. I enjoyed that. And then it was a lot about Claire learning to love and letting go of the past and Sydney rebuilding a relationship with her sister. And they both had kind of a difficult relationship with their mother and a lot of history came to the surface and got resolved during it. And there was a bad guy in the book, of course, and the apple tree heroically steps in. But, and there was a lot of foreshadowing too. It was, I liked the pace of it. I loved the descriptions of the recipes and um, 
and just the path that this that this book took it was really amazing yeah i think her website features recipes from each of her books too and nice. if you like her style she's written a number of books really i think okay. i've read them all that one was one of my favorites i but am definitely hooked yeah the she waverly clan does go on in nice. other books so okay but yeah it was just it wasn't as far-fetched enough to be fantastic but it would talk about like if you took a bite of an apple out of the tree, it would show you the biggest event in your life, which could be yes. a very bad thing or a very good thing. Right. And um, and Claire kind of periodically goes through and buries all the apples because she doesn't want anybody eating them. She doesn't use anything to cook with them. And um, and then toward the end, like people do eat the apples, and it's not always a bad thing, but sometimes it can be. But right. It was it was very interesting. Yeah. Yeah, I like, um, like you said, there were like nasturtiums that mm -hmm. aid in keeping secrets and pansies that make children thoughtful. So she was a caterer and used this knowledge to like serve in her banquets and ever oh and she... there was a couple that was starting to get kind of a rocky spot in their relationship and the the mother of the of the wife paid Claire to come bake some kind of like love is forever buffet. <laughs> <laughs> and then Claire figured out what was going on and started because it was supposed to diss her sister too and stirred in like some apology plants or something I forgot what it was but it worked and yeah. um yeah and then but the parents the mother and and her daughter figured out what was going on didn't pay Claire the rest of the catering fee which was sad yeah so but yeah I loved that everything had a message that she prepared yeah I think that author lives in Asheville, North Carolina, too. No kidding. Yeah. So, yeah. No, I like her books a lot. Ah, oh, very nice. All right. What so do you have next on your... My second one is called The Language of Flowers. And this one I read a while ago. It's by Vanessa Diffenbaugh. Mm. And this book was written by a woman. This was her debut novel. And I believe she spent time in the foster care system. And the profits from this book, she channeled into something with flowers and foster care children. But this was like on everybody's book club list, mm. like several years ago. But anyway, we start with the main character is Victoria. And she has spent the majority of her childhood in the foster care system. She's not able to get close to anyone. Mm. Her real connection to the world is through flowers and their meanings. And the story mm. is told through flashbacks of when Victoria was 10 and she went to live with a woman named Elizabeth. Mm. And so you're going from when she was 10 years old on up and now she's an adult. So at 18, she's emancipated from the system. Mm. She's sleeping in a public park. Um, she plants a garden of her own and a mm. local florist discovers her talent with flower flowers and mm. offers her a job. Um, she f finds love in a way, but she has a lot of difficulty accepting that people can care for her and accepting mm. commitment. Like she has a really difficult time with this. And that mm. was the one thing that, that was difficult for me about the story is she has so many people supporting her, mm. but at times she was so unlikable and so like snappy and just unpleasant and just some of the things she did, mm. you know, it makes you wonder like, why would anyone be in your corner, you know, Victoria? But but they were, God bless them, they were. <laughs> um, so there is a family secret that's at the root of this. So it's difficult to talk about this because I don't want to give that away. Yeah. Um, so as, as you're going in those back chapters, you realize like, because you're thinking to yourself, why did Elizabeth and Claire, like, why wasn't she adopted? Because that's who really brought her out of her shell. Mm. And you find out why. So, um, and so the, there is resolution to the family secret? There, There is. Okay. And it ends on a hopeful note um, because she does end up having a child with Grant and then she can't really handle it. So mm. you're wondering like, oh, is she going to make all the same mistakes? Like, is mm. her child going to be unwanted the way she was? You know, but things come around. Mm -hmm. What I'll say is it does have a, a hopeful ending. 
Um, but what I really liked about this book was the fact that she got to a point in her life and she created her own business. I think it was, what was it called? Um, I can't, oh, it was called Message hmm. because the flowers would send a message. And it got to the point where there was such a strong word of mouth campaign. Like mm -hmm. people wanted her to do their flowers because she had this gift of kind of seeing what you needed out of mm -hmm. that relationship and what to make it successful and she wouldn't accept everybody hmm. um so that was the cool part is learning about what flowers and why she used them and you know so forth um and it was i think it would make a good book club choice mm -hmm. like you know for people to discuss a about the foster care system and what happened and all the repercussions for her but b the the language of flowers was really yeah you know, really cool. And I won't go up, oh, go in too much about that because my next book is a nonfiction book about the language of flowers. So I'm going <laughs> to talk a little bit more about them in a bit. But yeah, so Victoria got on my nerves a little bit. But you know, that happens with me. You know, it, it's hard when you have someone that has a lot of life challenges, because sometimes the character is kind of unlikable at times. But mm -hmm. I was still glad I read the book. And I really liked it the first time I read it. Mm -hmm. You know, I think it was more judgy this time. Uh, <laughs> isn't it amazing how you can read the same book again and see it in a totally different way? Yes. And I really like, yeah, I like yeah. doing that too. Or you go back and you're like, why did I like this in the first place? I also read <laughs> The Red Garden before. And I didn't remember that I read it until I went to write the review. And I was like, oh my gosh, I read this book. What are you talking about? Yeah. So who knew? Oh, I do like reading books over and over again, though, too, because you pick up on things that you missed the first time or so. And yep. and if you're reading something nonfiction, there's so much detail in there right. to absorb that I really like to listen to. I like to listen to nonfiction over and over again to absorb all those dates and everything. Yeah. So, yeah. All right. All right. But um, you mentioned the foster care system, and that dovetails nicely into my book, A Memory of Violets by Hazel Gaynor, which is about... Um, 19th century street sellers in London and she bases this on a factual charitable society that she discovered during her research and she mentioned that Philippa Gregory I think read a draft of this which I found amazing oh wow and then yeah. commented yeah that she helped support the the path to publication for this I think I remembered that right um but it follows two little girls um Rosie and Flory, and they were little. Um, they were little girls who lived in Rosemary Court in London, and it was kind of the Irish neighborhood. And the descriptions that she included in the book about the poverty in these neighborhoods mm -hmm. was just heartbreaking. It was incredible. And in the back, the author talks a little bit about her research process, which I, which I found really interesting because getting the experience of everyday people can be really, really challenging. Not a lot of people wrote about what it was like in, in the tenement houses and, and in the areas. Um, but at some point, and this was very difficult to read as a mom because these kids are going through all these difficult challenges. Their mom passes away and they're facing everything by themselves. And the father's in the picture, but not really in the picture. So he is a rag and bone man, mm -hmm. they describe him as. So he goes around and he, and he gathers up bits of iron and rags and bones for whatever reason, um, but really doesn't have any kind of interest in his daughter's lives taking care of them. So Flory's, I think, about eight years old. Rosie's four. Rosie's kind of partially blind. Flory, I think, had polio, so walked for the crutch. Oh, wow. So there was disabilities factored in there, too. Um, but they get separated. And then it follows Flory's lifelong search to find her sister. And I don't want to give too much away, but it was really, really heartbreaking um, to read because you read it from Flory's perspective. You somebody finds her diary later and, and reads it and it's all written from, and it's written in like the vernacular too. So you can really hear like a small child talking mm -hmm. to you about it. And, um, but Flory and Rosie cross paths with somebody named Albert Shaw, who is based on a real life philanthropist from the 19th century named John Groom, who started, um, 
a charitable organization called Cripplage, where he took flower girls and watercress sellers and um, taught them how to make artificial flowers. And their big break came when Queen Alexandra was celebrating the anniversary of when she came to England. And they had Alexandra Rose Day. So they had thousands and thousands of these flowers that they were making for Alexander Rose, Alexandra Rose Day, and they raised something like 30,000 pounds. Oh, wow. And yeah, selling that. So it really um, established this organization, which continued. Um, today, I need to look it up to see if it's still active, but she said it was about 10 years ago, and uh, it's called Livability, I think now. But she based Albert Shaw on the playwright who wrote... Eliza Doolittle Mm -hmm. and Albert after Prince Albert who was Queen Victoria's beloved husband so there was a cross between Prince Albert and George Bernard Shaw well that's interesting it was it was it was fascinating and and you know so there was like a tone of desperation and struggle in it too but there was also that like strong ribbon of hope with um, Albert Shaw's work and and just how he gave the girls like a purpose and meaning like some some way to earn a living yeah so which was pretty amazing and then some of them stayed on Flory stayed on and, and became a house mother and then other girls would go into domestic service or they would stay on and they would work in the flower factory and um, the fa- flower factory conditions still sound pretty brutal I mean they worked from like eight in the morning till six at night and they were kids so I mean that did not sound easy either but compared to what their life was like on the streets and they were you know barefoot and freezing cobble stones and all that yeah so um and I remember one vivid description was Flory was talking about how thankful she was to not have to go mudlarking in the Thames River. Oh, is that when they go and they find stuff in the, yeah. I thought that sounded amazing. But then when, when Flory was talking about it, it was like, no, you're in your bare feet in the freezing water and you're stepping on rusty nails and broken glass. And oh. I was like, that's terrible. So I always had this vision of mudlarking as being like this awesome treasure hunt. And right. No, not so much. Not okay. So much. Yeah. So yeah. that that really um, kind of burst my bubble. I was gonna say. Yeah. Yeah, because I've read other books where they talk about that and yeah. made it like, oh, what was it? The Lost Apothecary or something like uh-huh. somebody goes and finds something in the Thames and then it takes her back. I forget what the book was now, but mm-hmm. I'll have to mm-hmm. look that up. Yeah, but there's I think there's a Facebook group that talks about the finds that people discover. Like I think there was a Henry the Eighth brooch that somebody recently found. Wow. Yeah. So but yeah, that that description that Flory had of mudlarking and just yeah. Yeah. I don't no. think they do it like that way no. in modern day times. Thank goodness. No. No. <laughs> no. But if I ever do go mudlarking I will be thinking of young Flory. Yes. So yeah. But yeah, I highly recommend A Memory of Violets. It is a bit of a, an emotional read, but it does end on an uplifting note, which I enjoyed. Oh, so, good. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And it spanned the 1870s to about the 19 teens, so, which was interesting. All right. For so. lovers of historical fiction. Yes. Have to remember that one and see if it's on Hoopla for my book club. Oh, and it has book discussion questions in the back of it. Always a plus. So built right in. Yeah. I know. I love it. <laughs> All right. Well, my last one, like I said, is a nonfiction, and um, it's called Floriography, an Illustrated Guide to the Victorian Language of Flowers by Jessica Rue. And um, it's really interesting. It's, it's very much just like the flower or the plant, and then it gives you the meaning, the origin, and how to pair it like with different plants so that you really have a yeah. unique meaning. Um, the one of the ones I thought was really interesting. I'll I'll just go over a couple. Was carnation, oh. and they trace it back to the crucifixion of Christ, and it was associated with heartache and a mother's eternal love for her son. But supposedly, like his blood hit the ground and carnation sprung up. Oh, yeah, interesting. This is this is the lore. Um, gladiolas, which I had a brother in the floral business, and a lot of people used to use them from. For funerals, like you would see them in big sprays, you know, in the church. Mm-hmm. Gladiolus means you pierced my heart. Oh. Yeah. So um, Heather brings luck and protection. Mm. Um, the one that really cracked me up was sunflowers are so popular with so many people. Mm-hmm. And sunflower, the meaning is false riches. <gasps> 
So supposedly this is the, how it started. Ancient Incas believed that the yellow flower symbolized their god, the sun god Inti. Oh. And they decorated their bodies and temples and everything with sunflower-shaped jewelries made of gold. Um, so when the Spanish conquistadors came and they were impressed by the abundance of treasure, when they saw the actual flower fields, they thought they were being led to the treasure trove. Oh, okay. But of course it's not. They were just the plants. Um, so that led to the Bloom's association with false riches. Oh. Yeah, which, um, but I don't care. I still love them. I think they're very cheerful. Um, they're similar to one of my other favorites, which is the Black Eyed Susan, mm -hmm. which is the Maryland state flower. Nice. Um, and the Black Eyed Susan is a symbol of encouragement. Mm -hmm. And it's considered very adaptable because it traveled from the east over here to the west. Um, a plant determined to survive and bloom where it's planted. Um, I sent my, my daughter a message today because she's getting married in September. And mm. I was like, do you have dahlias in your <laughs> wedding bouquet? Because you really need dahlias. <laughs> they um, symbolize longevity and commitment. So very popular wedding flower in Victorian times. They were also called the queen of the autumn garden. Because Watch, it, that's going to be your son-in-law's boutonniere. It's going to yes, be a dahlia. Because <laughs> it blooms for extended periods of time, especially in the fall months. And one of my book club ladies that actually passed away recently mm. used to have a huge field of dahlias behind oh. her house. And she would bring in um, bouquets for for me and mm. like I would put them out for the library staff but she also yeah. used to have something she called it the little free florist oh, so wow. during the pandemic she would put out flower displays wow. in um, her yard and people would come pick them up so that flower always reminds me of of her and what a giving person she was but oh. yeah dahlias are also beautiful and they come in so many colors and everything else but mm -hmm. yeah I just mm -hmm. was fascinated looking at um the different flowers like we were talking about roses mm -hmm, you know mm -hmm. red roses are true love and a lot of people like yellow roses mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and they don't really mean quite the same thing no they kind of mean the opposite yes, yeah yes. yeah and so, the pink roses had a different meaning too i think yeah and, yeah so yeah yeah it was very uh very unusual but and then the book at the end gives you ideas for bouquets for different things like a bouquet for friendship which would be zinnia, apple blossom, pansy, and eucalyptus, um, a bouquet for courting for those of you that were looking for love, a bouquet for marriage, um, sympathy. So yeah, it was kind of kind of interesting. Regret and sorrow, forgotten obligations, a bouquet for warnings. Like, like who does that? Foxglove for secrecy. Yeah. Don't eat it. <laughs> new beginnings. Your lilac oh, is in there for new beginnings. First love. So, yeah, it was pretty interesting. That is a great book. When that first hit our shelves, I checked it out, too. I remember unpacking it, and I was like, oh, yeah, this is going to be one of my first reads. Yeah. The illustrations are amazing in there. The descriptions are not too dense, and it's, yeah. And even the way the flowers are arranged in the bouquets, too, like which way they're pointing means a different thing. It's oh, just, that's interesting. Oh, yeah. So yeah. I want that's got to be maddening, like staring at your bouquet and like, what if you interpret something in there and you think like your suitor meant to say something and he just didn't think of it and just stuck the flower in there? Right. What like, if he just bought something at Wegmans he thought looked <laughs> good, you know? <laughs> or the Victorian equivalent. Yeah. Like, right. There you go. Yeah. And, and you're all like, oh, my God, he's going to propose tomorrow. <laughs> right. <laughs> nope. Yeah. No, no, he just... Oh, that would that would really be bad. Yes, be careful with your secret language of yeah. flowers because the other person might not know what you're thinking of. Do your homework. Or, yes, or do, if your, you're a, do your homework. You're addicted to floriography. We're all like, we know the meaning of this and you're trying to say this to me. I'm offended. <laughs> I don't like it. Oh, I, I will have to take another look at that book too, yeah. though, too, because I think that would be really fun to put together bouquets with different meanings. Oh, definitely. So, yeah. I love that. So um, my last book is the one I was least excited about. It's um, a botanist's guide to parties and poisons. And bit of a fun fact, I was reading it during Easter dinner and my brother-in-law was looking at me and he's like, I'm not eating that trifle you bought. 
<laughs> well, thinking that you're poisoning your guests. <laughs> just seeing them write nose in a book, and he's yeah. like, "Is that safe to eat?" And I was like, "Of course it is. This is my homework." <laughs> but it was a murder mystery type feel to it. Um, but there were some serious undertones to this book too, which I found interesting. The premise is it follows the career path of a graduate student, Saffron Everly, who is um, kind of following her botanist father's footsteps at um, a university, I think in London. And um, there's a poisoning at a party. Her mentor is framed for it. And then it's up to her to track down the real killer. Okay. So they go off to the Amazon on some kind of expedition to find this mythical oxal auto vine, I think, which the um, the author actually totally made up because I was going to fact check that. <laughs> but um, there was kind of like an undertone of the Jungle Cruise movie to like going to the Amazon for that flower that heals everybody um so i got that kind of vibe to it too and it's historical right like she's like one of the only women in the program i think i started that book i didn't finish it so yes she's um one of the only women in the department there and she um she does talk about the sexual harassment that she experiences and um the definite like roadblocks that are put in her way to keep her from advancing and how she faced that so that was troubling too and one of the other main cal- characters alexander ashton was in world war one and they talk about his ptsd from being in the trenches so that was um that was very eye-opening too. So you think mm-hmm. it's going to be like kind of a lighthearted murder mystery, but no, you have the sexual harassment at the university department, and you have the PTSD from the trenches to deal with too. So, so not really like a cozy mystery then. No, okay. no. I thought this was going to be a nice chill weekend read, and I was like, oh my goodness, no, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> and then I skipped to the end of it because I was like, okay, well, I really want to know about her research journey. <laughs> so, like, how did she come up with this idea? What's true in this? Book, what's not and she actually spent a lot of time in the university library for the campus that this is based on oh wow. in the archives yeah tracking down whether or not there were greenhouses on campus she said there weren't but i find that really hard to believe yeah <laughs> that there weren't but she was very effusive in her thanks to the libraries and their help with her research which i found very refreshing and reaffirming so that was really wonderful but I think, I kind I of think that's going to continue as a series, yes. too. It left off on a cliffhanger because I did read the ending because oh I want to know the revolution. Okay. Yeah. It left off on, on a cliffhanger. So, yeah. And um, and it says a Saffron Everly mystery. So I'm like, why didn't I pick up on that, that yes. it's going to be a series? Yes. So, Saffron yeah, I think was... maybe when I'm in a different kind of mood, I would be more more into it. Yeah. Sometimes you do need to be in the right mood for something. Yeah. So... And I don't feel any shame in putting something down if it's not the right time. So Absolutely. Yeah. There's a whole other stack of books waiting for us, right, Claire? <laughs> always. Always. Yes. So. All right. So we hope that some of these books will get you in the mood for springtime, gardening, nice weather. Come and, check out uh, our book display. Yes. Come in and check out the book display. And you've got quite a few nonfiction as well as fiction. Yes. So. There's definitely a mix. There's yeah about how to make a Japanese garden, a rock garden, a fairy garden. A lot of interesting, interesting titles that we have here in our collection. Awesome. So but thank you for joining us, and we will see you next time when I'm going to be introducing another member of our staff. And thanks for following us, and have a good day. Thanks. Book Break is a production of the Greece Public Library, made possible through the support of the Friends of the Greece Public Library. The music composed and performed by Sean.